Hi, my name is John Clayton, and I'm here to spend some time with you and talk about my favorite instrument, the bass. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So I want to take a moment out to thank Philadelphia's All City Jazz Festival. Yay! Keep it up. It's such a beautiful effort that you're undertaking and making happen. So thank you. Also thank you to the Philly Pops for helping to make this happen. So this is going to be a little, a few moments that I get to talk about uh, the bass to my bass brothers and sisters. All those young people out there that are interested in having fun with this instrument. And by the way, yes, that is my new F-bomb. F-U-N-N. Four-letter word. Fun. If I'm not having fun, I go home. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out ways that we can increase our fun. You're already having fun. And you're curious about how can I like do more stuff and have even more fun, obviously. So we'll talk about some things that will hopefully uh, get you on that path. Um, a few of the basic things. First of all, standing. Um, how do you stand at the base? Well, basically, I like to think of my posture, whatever that is, some comfortable posture. And I want to take that, keep it the way it is, as much as possible, and then bring the base to that posture, right? And then I want to be able to continue this way. I want to position myself so that I'm comfortable. Um, and I can control these things, by the way, by looking in a mirror. Now, standing at the base, there are a lot of different ways to do all this. And if you have a private teacher, Great, do whatever it is that he or she says, that's wonderful. Along with figuring it out yourself, one of the things that I figured out is that um, it makes more sense to not have the bass pointing straight up. Instead, because when the bass is pointing straight up, then I have to have the bass really low. Otherwise, I can't play all those notes up there, right? But when the bass is really low, then I'm playing and I have to go like this, and I get that old person's posture, right, with my bent back like this. Instead of that, I maintain my natural, normal standing posture, and then bring the bass to me and make sure that the bass height is such that it's high enough for me to play. We've learned, after many years, that it isn't the most efficient use of our energy to have the bass pointed straight up. Why? Because then I have to like lean over in order to access this register of the bass. <clears throat> and like I said before, if I'm going to keep my posture this way, having the bass high means that I can't access those notes unless I lean the bass against my body. Think like a cellist, for instance, and a lot of bass players, for instance, that sit. They'll sit with their instrument at an angle. Uh, we've also learned that it makes more sense to stand more behind the bass than on the side of the bass. Why? Because if I'm standing on the side of the bass, then it may feel good because I'm really close to the action, I'm really close to the fingerboard where my hand's going to be, right? That makes sense. But it ends up doing a lot of, well, I won't say damage. Sometimes it does do damage, but it's a lot more work uh, in order to play with our left hand because we have to curl our wrist around like this so much in order to play here when we stand on the side of the bass. <clears throat> it also means that our elbow can't come up, which it needs to do. Anyway, I won't bore you with all the... Trust me, if you... <laughs> rather than stand on exactly the side of the bass or exactly behind the bass, which is... both of those can work, I kind of split the difference and let the bass rest on me. Yes, I do have to get used to um, having the weight against my body and a little bit against my thumb, which is why most people automatically play with the bass pointing straight up because they don't have any weight against their thumb, right? But like I said, there are a bunch of problems that go along with that. Anyway, um, so now what do we do? Let's, let's concentrate on our left hand for a moment. Our left hand, the thumb, talk about the thumb. The thumb is best used 
if it's in kind of a horizontal position behind the neck, behind the fingerboard. So rather than have our thumb pointed up this way, uh, it makes a lot more sense, we've learned, if our thumb is instead this way. Why? Because then we get to use our fingers more freely. If our thumb is pointed this way, now I have a problem with the, the palm of my hand collapsing and sort of rubbing against the fingerboard, making it harder for me to shift, making it nearly impossible for me to do things like vibrato if I want to do that. So it just makes more sense. When my thumb is behind the neck, then I also make sure that it's not just flat, but it's kind of angled this way, right? So not flat, but angled this way a little bit. Uh, in fact, you can see what happens. My hand's like this, I put my thumb flat on the fingerboard, my finger's this way. Now, if I want to play, I have to sort of force my fingers into that position in order to play. It's a lot of tension and it will cause pain. Instead, I put my thumb at an angle, and look what my fingers just did. They were that way flat, now I do that with my thumb, and my fingers can more easily play the notes and access the notes, right? So that's a really important thing with the left hand, how the thumb is positioned. Uh, when we play with our fingers, we want to play on the tips of our pads, right? Not on the tip of our tippy tip thing, right? And that's painful. That can be really painful. Instead, we angle our hand so that we are able to play on the tips of the pads of our fingers. You know, there's more kind of meatier flesh there that you can deal with. That's a really important thing. Um, moving right along, let's talk about the right hand a bit. You know, how do we deal with the right hand? What are some right hand considerations? Uh, number one, I find that it, in most cases, it's best if our thumb is on the edge of the fingerboard, right? Not underneath the fingerboard, on the edge of the fingerboard. Not on top of the string, right? On the edge of the fingerboard. And it's a really good technique to learn, even if you do learn other techniques. I would start with this one if you're looking. Thumb on the edge of the fingerboard, and I'd say for a good 80% of the time, our thumb needs to be all the way down to the end of the fingerboard. So not up here, not here, right, all the way down there. Then you can get a nice, strong sound when you pizzicato, when you pluck. Um, so our thumb's on the edge of the fingerboard, and it, it again, is shaped like this, not like this, not like this but like that, boom. Our finger, our index finger is pointed down toward the floor, toward the ground, toward the bridge of the base, okay? So that's where our finger is. And I like to make sure that my finger is actually kind of getting a piece of the string. So I kind of angle my hand this way, not kind of glazing over the strings that way, but instead angle my hand that way, finger pointed toward the ground, get a piece of the string, and let the next string over stop your finger, like that. So if I take all that over to this string, right, pluck and let the next string stop your finger, pluck and let the next string stop your finger, pluck, and of course here there's no string left, and we just do that. So those are some real kind of basic, again, I know a lot of people, and I myself, will sometimes take my hand and angle my hand this way. My thumb is still on the edge of the fingerboard, kind of pivoting that way if I want it to. So now I go like this, and I can use two fingers, or I can use three fingers, or whatever, four if you want to. Um, but I, I generally use two, and I'll angle my hand that way so that I can play a lot faster. Uh, I have friends that, that keep these two fingers together when they play, and pluck with both fingers at the same time. Um, 
even not only with your fingers this way, but also with your fingers kind of angled toward the floor, but using two instead of one. So there are a multitude of ways that you can do that. I've given you just some basic ones there. Um, more fun with basics. Let's say you're going to be jamming with your friends or playing in the band, playing in, in your, your big band at school. You know, what are some of the basic things we need to know that make that even more F-U-N-N, to make that even more fun? Uh, first of all, all of our chords. you got to know your chords. So that means you have to know your major triads. In C, that would be... You have to know your minor triads. In C, that would be... dominant seventh chord. When it says C7, you got to know that it, that consists of C minor 7. Uh, C6. C minor 6. Next on my list would be ensemble focus. Like, if you're playing in an ensemble, what do you need to be concerned about? Well, number one, I believe that our focus needs to automatically go to the drums. Because the drum, the drum and bass hookup, that connection is so crucial. If you're playing in a jazz swing style and the drummer's going ding, ding, ga ding, ding, ga ding, ding, ga ding, ding, and you're walking, you're playing a, a quarter notes, you guys are the only two people in the band that have to play every quarter note together. So when I'm playing, my first focus goes to the drums automatically, right? So if I've got to play. so on, I'm making sure that every note is connected to the drum beat. Every note. <clears throat> so that's an important hookup. Um, the next focus would be to the piano, <coughs> excuse me, to the piano and guitar. So the piano and guitar obviously are going to be supplying, in most cases, the chords that we need to connect with. The piano player or guitar player is going to play something that will make me play a different bass note or a different bass line or a different chord or something like that. So along with focusing on the drums, I'm also focusing on the keys and the guitar to make sure that that connection is there and healthy. Um, the last thing that I'm really listening to in terms of focus is whoever's playing the melody, if it's not me. I'm listening to that horn player, that, you know, that saxophone player, that trumpet player, that trombone player, or that vocalist, to find out how it, that melody is played and how it fits with what I'm doing and what we're doing in the rhythm section. So, let's review that real again, again real quick. Number one, we're focusing on the drums. We're focusing also on the chordal instruments, the guitar and the keys. Right? And we're also focusing on the melody and or the soloist. And what you do is start with the drums and then maybe, you know, after a few bars you focus on something else. You get to the point where while you're playing, while you're, you know, grooving and playing your bass line, you hear everything together. And if it feels good, great. If it doesn't, because you're listening so closely, you'll know what's going on and how you need to alter things if you need to. So that's really important, that focus thing. Uh, let's talk about a walking bass line. You know, so you are going to have to walk a bass line, which is what we all love to do. But when I'm walking a bass line, what are the things that I have to think about? First of all, a walking bass line is basically uh, playing quarter notes in most cases. Let's see if you're playing um, again a, a blues
blues, right? Uh, if I'm playing a blues in F, then a walking bass line is going to sound like this. One, two, three, four, uh, trying to keep all of my notes really long and connected to each other, you know, I could play them really short too and go. That's not what we're looking for. You want them to ring. Play each note as long as possible, hold it down with your left hand, let it decay naturally. Connect it to the next note. Um, <clears throat> I'm also thinking about, again, that hookup with the drums, right? So that my notes fit with his or her notes, his or her beat, right? That's so important. I can't stress that enough. Really, really important. Uh, so where do you get all this information if you don't have a teacher living with you in your living room or whatever? What you do is you make sure that you get sound sources sound sources that represent what it is you also want to do. And it would be great if I could say to Miles Davis and Wynton Kelly and uh, Philly Joe Jones and Wayne Shorter or whatever, hey, can we play this song? You know, it'd be great if I could do that, but I can't. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I can. So I can get those records of all those fantastic musicians playing all that beautiful music, I can get those recordings and I can learn exactly what they did. I can play along with them. And you know what? I can play that song 75 times in a row and Miles Davis will never complain. <laughs> and when you do that, you put your feet in the shoes of all these masters and you get to see what it feels like to play those bass lines, to play those grooves, to play those songs. They won't let you rush. They won't let you drag, right? So the more we do that, the more fun we have with it that way, when we finally get to with our friends and we get to play that song or similar songs, we're developing a vocabulary of ideas that we can use in those other situations with our friends live. doesn't mean you'll play the exact same bass line or the exact same notes. That might happen too occasionally, no biggie. But it does mean you'll have more things to choose from, things to draw from as you create your bass lines, as you create your grooves. So those are some really cool things to sort of latch on to. Uh, that in combination with obviously the music that you're going to have to read in a lot of situations, uh, it's just doing more and more of it to allow yourself to get more comfortable with it. But um, one last thing I want to say uh, is that the music is in you, it's not in the bass. The bass just happens to be the best instrument on the planet. So if the music is not clear in your body, it'll never come out clearly through the bass. What's the barometer that we use to make sure that that's the case? It's singing. We have to sing and play everything we sing. Sing and play what you sing. Don't sing what you play. Right? Sing and play what you're singing. For instance, I'm going to go That might be a bass line I want to play. So I, I, you just heard me sing it and I'm going to go not in the bass. Let the bass be the amplifier for the music that's inside of you. So thanks for spending some time with me. Good luck. Uh, play the music. Have F-U-N-N. -N. 
Be sure to do the research. It's fun research. It's not like a drag. It's really fun. So I can't wait to hear you play. Looking forward to your music. Thank you again, Philadelphia. Your All City Jazz Festival uh, makes this happen, and we're so happy that they do. Likewise, Philadelphia Pops. Thank you so much. Thank you.